Hello everyone, Ray here. I thought a little housekeeping might be in order to fully appreciate this episode. It might behoove you to listen again to episode 63, where we covered in detail the evolution of Operation Compass. Not necessary, mind you, just suggested. Also, and I apologize for being obvious here, you might want to look at a map of Operation Compass. I did use a map as the cover art for this episode, but it will probably come out too small for your iPod, iPhone, Zune, or whatever uh, MP3 device that you use. But if you're like me, and you've done none of the following suggestions that I just made, please know, as always, that I will try to draw you a mental map during the episode. I'll make sure to mention what direction the troops are going to, where they came from, um, some, uh, one point that's relative to another, and hopefully all of this will come together very nicely. And just a quick heads up, if you don't usually listen to the post-episode commentary, you might want to this time, as I have several announcements to make, and I think there's one in particular that you will find uh, interesting. You know what? Before we begin, I'm just going to go ahead and describe the area to you. I think it'll make it a lot easier. Um, and this only take a second, so um, please bear with me. Uh, picture the North African coast. Um, in the middle of our picture, along the coast, is the village town, uh, City Barani. And that's where Graziani went to, and that's where he had the statue made um, celebrating the invasion of Egypt. And then about 12 miles to the east, still along the coast, is Maktila. That's uh, truly the furthest penetration that the Italians have, but it's a, sm uh, a much smaller force there. City Barani is the main camp. Um, just below or to the south of City Barani are your two, two more camps, okay? And right below that is Nabewa. Now, there's a huge gap between Nabewa and the camps kind of south, southwest of that, because there's a, a escarpment there. There's a rise in the ground, um, big hills. The tanks would have a very hard time going through that. So there's a big gap between the escarpment and Nabewa. So O'Connor figures out that he could go into that gap, sneak up behind the camps and hit them. So first he hits Nabewa, then he hits Tamar's, the two Tamar camps, and then he's going to hit Sidi Barani. But it's that gap that allows him to do all this. Um, about 16 miles or so to the west of Sidi Barani, again on the coast, is Buck Buck. And we'll touch on that as well because that's where the British force, forces make it uh, in this episode. So I hope that helped. Um, because if you don't understand the gap and why it's there and how they use it, uh, none of this is going to make any sense. All right, so let's get on with it. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 74, Operation Compass. After the devastation at Taranto, and the embarrassing Italian reverses in Greece. Everyone who was anyone knew that German participation in North Africa and Greece was only a matter of time. General Richard O'Connor was racing against the very results of recent Allied successes and Churchill's patience, but that was Wavell's job to contend with. Meanwhile, General O'Connor was busy assimilating information from aerial photos, covert intelligence, and desert patrols about Italian dispositions. By now, he had an accurate picture of where Marshal Graziani had spread out his more numerous forces. But to General O'Connor's thinking, the Italians' dispositions were unsound. The bulk of their forces were in a fixed line of camps not too far from the British, who had successfully harassed them while retreating east that summer. Whereas O'Connor had his men on a more mobile footing, far away from the enemy, with a covering force in between them. After all, desert warfare demanded mechanized mobility. And probably the most foolish aspect of Graziani's formation was, his camps were too far away from each other to offer mutual support. This alone negated their numerical superiority. As covered in episode 63, when Richard O'Connor was chosen to head up this limited offensive, he rejected Wavell's plan of hitting the Italians on their flanks. Now that he knew their layout, he surmised that the space between their forward camps, Nabewa and Sofafi, was their Achilles heel, and that's where his operation against them would begin. 
In essence, the British would move up and dominate the gap between the camps. Then, as one British force covered the camps to the south, the camps to the north would be bypassed and hit from behind, or from the west. Once Nebewa was taken, the rest of the battle would be like knocking over dominoes. The Tumar camps further north would be exposed, and so taken, again from behind. This would leave Sidi Barani's southern flank open, so the attack would be repeated. Once that was taken, the Italians' defensive position in Egypt would be cut in two. But to make sure Tumar nor Sidi Barani were rescued or reinforced, another group made up of light tanks would head northwest towards Bukbuk, about 20 miles west of Sidi Barani. As Bukbuk was along the coast road, this force would not only halt any reinforcements trying to make their way east, but also cut off any forces trying to retreat to the west. Commander-in-Chief Middle East Wavell approved O'Connor's plan on November 2nd, but again made it clear that it was only to be a five-day raid. Then O'Connor's troops were to retire to Matru. The commanding officer of Western Desert Force didn't ask his superior why there had to be a time limit. He just accepted his orders. The truth is, Wavell had a very good reason, but again, his desire for secrecy dominated him. If O'Connor had known the real reason, it most assuredly would have rumpled the normally composed general. By November 19th, Western Desert Force was ready to begin its preliminary operation. And because the gap in between Nabewa and Sofafi was paramount to success, forces were moved into it that day. As expected, the support group ran headlong into several Italian battle groups, but managed to push them out and gain control of the area. As for the Italians, they considered the attack a raid, nothing more, so left the Allied troops to it. As the time to start the attack was coming closer, it was decided to have a full-scale rehearsal on November 26th. The camp replica to be attacked was an exact model of Nabewa. Not that Barris 4th Pierce's 4th Indian Division knew that. On the morning of the 26th, an artillery barrage began, aimed at the eastern side of the camp, and lasted for two hours. The idea was to practice confusing the Italians. Then the 4th Indian would march on the camp. Afterward, the British leaders got together to dissect the results. Having the infantry hole up while their guns did their best to soften up the Italians was judged a waste of time. After all, why give a larger army with a larger air force and certainly more artillery pieces time to react? Speed was the only answer to each concern brought up. So O'Connor went back to the reconnaissance photos and then noticed that all the truck and tank tracks were around the northwest corner of the camp in Nebewa. They correctly surmised that location served as the entrance and exit, and thus was left unmined. So the plan was changed to use the artillery barrage as a diversion only. While brigades from the 4th Indian, along with heavy infantry tanks, a.k.a. Matildas, from the 7th Royal Tank Regiment, passed along the camp's southern perimeter, then turned north to enter the camp at its northwest corner. A second full-scale rehearsal was set for December 9th. The troops were told that this would allow them to incorporate the changes made, but this was just a red herring, one Wavell would have been proud of. December 9th was the date chosen to begin Operation Compass. Events moved quickly afterward. On December 5th, Wavell sent out his orders of attack to Western Desert Force. The next day, O'Connor issued his own orders. They were all about to find out if the last six months of training and planning had been worth it. Nabewa would be the first camp to be attacked. To do it would be the 4th Indian Division under Barris Forrest Pierce, along with I-Tanks from 7th Royal Tank Regiment. Meanwhile, Krieg's 7th Armored Division would mask the Sofafi Rabia camps south of the escarpment. On a side note, during all this, Krieg was at hospital, 
So the Desert Rats were under the command of Brigadier Blood Counter. Meanwhile, along the coast, the Matru garrison under Brigadier Selby, with help from gunboats of the Royal Navy, would attack Maktila from the east to draw their attention away from the south. As the final jumping-off point for the infantry and tanks attacking Abewa was only 15 miles southwest of the camp, the different formations moved out on December 7th. The idea was for everyone to be in place by late the next day, without being detected. That's where the Royal Navy and Air Force came in. Vice Air Marshal Longmore had Italian airfields bombed on the 7th. This, again, was diversionary. But, as an added bonus, numerous Italian aircraft, of all kinds, were destroyed during the attack. RAF fighters also made sure that no Italian aircraft entered the airspace over the gap or the support group's final destination at its jump-off point. However, despite their vigilance, one Italian reconnaissance plane did fly over the 4th Indian Division on the move. But it must have not spotted the long line of tanks or trucks, as no counterattack was forthcoming. Meanwhile, the 15-inch guns of the Monitor Terror, along with the gunboat Ladybird, harassed Sidi Barani and Maktila. The soldiers, all loaded into lorries or whatever was at hand, spent December 7th and 8th desperately trying to stay warm at night. Meanwhile, Certainly much warmer in his concrete ops room at Ma'at and Bagush, General O'Connor waited. Outwardly, he was calm. But underneath, who knows? However, his thoughts had to be of the fact that, on December 8th, the sky was clear and bright. And even if one Italian with a radio spotted his men, their larger foe would be organizing a ferocious welcome. On December 8th, the RAF attacks continued to keep the Italians confused, but also to hopefully drown out the noise made by the Matildas as they approached their jump-off point. By dusk of that day, all the units were in position. Starting along the coast, Selby's Matru garrison was just southeast of Maktila. Their job was at first to distract this most forward Italian position, but then be ready to drive them west once a net was in place. Just to their north, closer to the coast, dummy tanks had been set up along the road. To the far south, the 4th Indian Division was just east of the escarpment that divided the Rabia and Sofafi camps below from Nabewa, Tumar, and Sidi Barani, located above it. As previously mentioned, the 7th Armored would stay south and cover the lower camps, while other units from the 4th Indian, also with tanks from the 7th Royal Regiment, went north and around Nabewa and Tumar. During this, artillery batteries from the 4th Indian would head just east of Nabewa and begin their diversionary barrage. As O'Connor waited in Bagush, Wavell waited in Cairo. To throw off any suspicions that something was afoot, the commander-in-chief Middle East threw a party for his officers, after a day of golf. To any spies floating around the city, it would appear that December 9th was just another day for these British officers. But behind the golf clubs and mixed drinks, Wavell was considering the next few days. He was pleased with O'Connor Jumbo Wilson, and the final plan that had become Operation Compass. But the Duke of Aosta was still causing trouble in East Africa and had to be dealt with. And the only force that Wavell had for now was the 4th Indian Division. That's why Western Desert Force only had five days to bloody Graziani's nose and kick him out of Egypt. Because either way, success or no, the 4th Indian was heading to Eritrea in East Africa. This would effectively cut O'Connor's forces in half, but it couldn't be helped. Churchill had all but voiced his desire to remove Wavell. It didn't help, of course, that the Prime Minister was not privy to the date of Operation Compass. But Wavell knew that politicians see dates as deadlines, and the hostility between the men was tense enough as it was. 
The Maletti group, stationed at Camp Nebewa, was one of the better Italian units. But they had been idle too long. By December 8th, their routine must have seemed as old as the sands. After the sun went down that night, a few shots could be heard from the camp's defenders, and a few flares were shot off looking for invaders. But after midnight, things calmed down. And right after midnight, British troops started making their way further into the gap between the Italian camps. And when all was said and done, Operation Compass would end up being one of those few instances in war where everything goes right, against all odds, as if luck itself had placed a heavy wager on the outcome. Then, in the quarter moonlight, Brigadier Savory's 11th Indian Brigade and Lieutenant Colonel Jerem's 7th Royal Tank Regiment with 48 heavy infantry tanks broke away from the main assault force and raided themselves for their morning dash. Meanwhile, the 4th Indian Divisional Artillery, with 72 guns, also broke from the group and set up east of Nebewa. Hey everyone, Ray here. We've all been there. Seemingly out of nowhere, you get hit by an unexpected bill, and your world just stops. When that happens, you panic, so it's hard to think, what are my options? Well, that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart is here to help. Upstart-powered personal loans can help you pay down high-interest debt or help you survive that unexpected bill with simple and easy-to-understand payment terms. And just know, you are not alone. Upstart has helped over 1.8 million customers who are on their path to financial freedom with a fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And Upstart knows that you are more than just your credit score, which is why they factor in your income, employment, and other information in your loan application. That's how they get you the best deal. And you can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And you can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash World War II. That's upstart.com slash World War II to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash World War II. At 5 a.m. the next morning, the guns of the 4th Divisional Artillery opened up on the camp. They would only continue to fire for an hour, and accuracy nor destruction were their goal. They were to make as much noise as possible, while the assault force made their way west, under Nebewa's southern perimeter, and then turned north. At 6 a.m., the guns fell silent, and the Italians, thinking that the shells were nothing more than to make sure the camp inhabitants didn't sleep, kept their heads down for another hour, and then got on with their day at 7 a.m. But at that moment, some of the artillery guns opened up again, this time to find the range of the camp. That lasted for 15 minutes. Then, all 72 guns opened up on the camp. Still, their objective was to draw the camp's attention to the east. They also made sure that their shells did not find their way to the western side of the camp. As the artillery attack got underway, the heavy infantry tanks made for the northwest corner, followed by lorries. As they approached, about 20 medium M13 Italian tanks were caught outside the perimeter and quickly destroyed. Then, as the Matildas entered the camp, the 2nd Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders and a unit from the Rajpuntana Rifles jumped out of the trucks, driven by New Zealanders, about 700 yards from the camp, and followed close behind. At first, the Italians thought this was just more harassment, albeit more intense. But when they saw the eye tanks enter the camp, they assumed the worst and reacted, attacking the invading camps with guns, grenades, and then finally their anti-tank guns. It took them a few minutes to realize that even their anti-tank weapons were not getting the job done against these yet unseen heavy infantry tanks. And in those few minutes, many Italians were gunned down, including the camp commander, General Maletti who was killed while confronting a tank 
with his machine gun. Still, the men in the camp, especially the artillery units, gave a good account of themselves. But with the tanks already inside the camp and safe from Italian air power, the battle was a foregone conclusion. Organized resistance was over by 8.30 a.m., and two more hours saw the end to any remaining unaccounted for Italians. Suddenly, the invaders were prison guards, having taken possession of 2,000 prisoners and 35 tanks. This victory cost the British eight officers and 48 men. O'Connor was ready to the results and was soon on his way forward. Meanwhile, the assault force moved north to the Tumar camps. As the prisoners were secured, the 7th Royal Tank Regiment and Divisional Artillery were on the move. Their next task was to support Brigadier Lloyd's 5th Indian Infantry Brigade as it attacked Tumar West, using almost the exact pattern that brought Nabewa low. However, there were two significant changes. The element of surprise was gone, as were six Matildas that had been damaged while forming up to move. They had accidentally crossed into a minefield. Despite Tumar's readiness and the fewer tanks used against them, Tumar West was overrun. Part of the reason for this British success, besides the training and elan of the troops, was that the 5th Indian Brigade's approach was covered by a sandstorm that had recently risen, very near the camp's northwest corner. Also, before the 22 tanks and infantry invaded the camp, the Italians were served another diversionary artillery barrage that caused panic and confusion. However, again, the Italians fought well, especially the artillery batteries. But morale plummeted when they discovered that their guns were unable to stop the Matildas. During the fighting, the sandstorm refused to abate, which caused the struggle to go on longer than expected, if only because the combatants had trouble finding each other to offer combat. But, like Nabewa, with the heavy tanks and infantry already in the camp, even before the contest began, it was another foregone conclusion. By 4.20 p.m., Tumar West was subdued, and Tumar East was soon under attack. But Tumar East would not fall as fast as the other camps. As the 4th Indian Division was attacking there, the one Italian counterattack took place, trying to help their comrades within the camp. But British artillery, already organized and ready to fire on East Tumar, had its fire redirected for a spell. And their shells did more than just drive away the would-be rescuers. Those Italian forces targeted were destroyed by the concentrated firepower. The remaining survivors were taken prisoner. Still, this allowed Tamar East to fight just those British forces that had entered the camp, and the Italians fought back savagely. But with their communications down and no reinforcements coming, their resistance only lasted until the early morning of December 10th. During the first day of battle, General O'Connor went everywhere he could, but it wasn't to motivate the troops. They were as eager as he was. Although he didn't know the reason why, Wavell said, this was only to be a five-day raid, he knew he had only that much time to bloody the Italians and wanted to make the best of it. So, everywhere he went, he kept the men moving west, or letting them know where he expected them to attack tomorrow. The big picture was in his head. Everyone else just needed to follow orders. When he visited the headquarters of 7th Armored Division that afternoon, he told Brigadier Blood Conter, who was temporarily replacing Krieg, to send his patrols past Sofafi, south of Nabewa, and the escarpment the next day, to make sure the Italians there could not escape from that direction. O'Connor then headed north to find Barris Ford Pierce and the 4th Indian, as they were attacking Tumar East. He heard about the Italian counterattack, then that it was repulsed. So he went on with his directives and planning. O'Connor counseled with Barris Ford Pierce about what the morrow would bring. O'Connor was radiating energy, but head down, always thinking things through, while Barris Ford Pierce looked around, giving his opinions, all the while smoking his cheroots. They concluded that City Barani needed to be taken the next day, December 10th. 
So, as soon as Tumar East was mostly under control, that job being given to the 5th Indian Brigade, Brigadier Lomax's 16th British Brigade was to dash north and cut the coastal road just west of City Barani. A net was forming around Italy's latest acquisition. Also on the move that night of the 9th was the 11th Indian Brigade. Their job was to cut off any avenue of exit from Barani to the south. O'Connor's conference in the sand also resulted in Conter sending another light tank unit northwest, because intelligence told them that Italian tanks were forming up to the west of City Barani. But when the 4th Armored Brigade got there, no tanks were found. So, they continued northwest, reaching the coast road, and thus cutting off any traffic between City Barani and Buckbuck, 20 miles to the west. O'Connor's men were elated, but exhausted, and becoming concerned as they watched the supporting Matildas drop in numbers as the sandstorms, Italian mines, and traveling under their own power all this time took its toll. The various Indian infantry brigades were down to eight heavy tanks. But December 9th had not been perfect for the British. Selby Force, who was to distract their forces in Maktila along the coast, and then push hard once they heard that Nebewa had fallen, did not get the news for some unexplicable reason until 3.20 that afternoon. Getting such a late start allowed the 1st Libyan Division in Maktila to offer stiff resistance during the day and then slip out that night to make their way west toward City Barani. December 10th would be more problematic for the British Commonwealth forces because, firstly, the weather had worsened with even more powerful sandstorms. Next, the element of surprise was gone. And, finally, now that battle was joined, Italian positions and strengths could only be guessed at. Gone was the control that surprise had given the British, yet their goal for that day was the major prize, City Barani. As December 10th dawned, Tumar East was finally brought under control. More Italian prisoners would soon be marching east, deeper into Egypt, but under very different circumstances than they once imagined. The attack on City Barani under Beres Ford Pierce commenced during a dust storm at dawn, and the Italians inside, having communicated with their other camps as they fell, focused their defense on the northwest corner as well as to their east, knowing that Selby Force was just on the other side of two divisions slowly retreating back to Barani. So the attack from the south was unexpected and also undetected being obscured by the sandstorm. By the time the Italians figured out the truth, British troops and tanks were already inside the perimeter. From that moment on, until the afternoon, the fighting was carried out as the combatants bumped into each other through the swirling sand. The plan had been to use Barani as a net that would capture not only any loose Italian units that had escaped the previous day's attacks, but also the 1st Libyan Division and Blackshirt troops, after they abandoned Maktila the night before. But, again, Selby Force, though for different reasons than previously, did not manage to push the troops before them all the way back to Barani. So, when Barani fell that afternoon at 4.40 p.m. to Indian infantry and the heavy eye tanks of the 7th Royal Tank Regiment, there remained a sizable Italian force east of the town. All that remained west of Barani were scattered, unorganized remnants trying to hide or find someone to surrender to, to obtain food and water. That night of December 10th, infantry forces, along with their remaining tanks and artillery pieces, moved into place to finish off the two Italian divisions east of Barani. Ironically, two divisions worth of men was all that O'Connor had for Operation Compass. To O'Connor, Selby, and Barris Ford Pierce, it didn't seem to matter if the trapped Italians knew the Allied forces were closing in on them. However, prudence was not sacrificed for speed. Still, excitement dominated fatigue as everyone sensed, the end was near. I love that sound. The sound of another sale on Shopify 
the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. What are you waiting for? Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. I love how Shopify has the tools and resources to make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. Reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash worldwar2, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash world war two right now. Shopify.com slash world war two. Early next morning, December 11th, O'Connor rose and managed not to show his excitement as he planned to meet up with the fourth Indian divisional commander for the coup de croix against the Italian forces in Egypt. However, the commanding general's heart was not as light as it had been when he first awoke. Right before he left, a message from Wavell had come through that, on that very day, O'Connor was to lose the 4th Indian Division, literally half of his forces. Taking a page from Wavell's book, O'Connor decided not to tell anyone just yet and focused on finishing the job at hand. O'Connor and Beresford Pierce met up and then commenced their ferocious attack on the surrounded Italian troops. Like the attacks of the last two days, the battle was a foregone conclusion. The survivors were taken prisoner and organized to begin their long march east. Further west, the 7th Armor Brigade had moved into position the night before and, at dawn, launched themselves at Buckbuck. They just managed to cut off the retreating 64th Cantanzaro Division. There would be more prisoners marching east, as their equipment and supplies were confiscated by the victors. However, it was not the same situation further south. The 4th Armored Brigade was ordered to go into reserve, but then ordered to cut off the retreating 63rd Serene Division from Sofafi. No one ever figured out the why of the conflicting orders, but either way, the Serene Division made good its escape. For O'Connor, who was losing his well-trained and hard-fighting men, it appeared to be a sign of things to come. Still, by the night of December 11th, after three days of hard but clever fighting, all Italian resistance east of the buck buck line was gone. And, 24 hours later, the same could be said of all Italian forces in Egypt except for a rear guard at Solemn. All other Italians were either captured or dead. The tally for three days of fighting saw the British Commonwealth soldiers destroy two Italian corps, capture 38,000 prisoners, which included four generals, and take 73 tanks and 237 artillery pieces. All this cost O'Connor 624 soldiers, killed, wounded, or missing. The question before the commanding officer of Operation Compass now was, should Western Desert Force take their victory, for it certainly was so much more than a raid, and return to Matru? After all, they had obtained their goal of securing Egypt. There were now tens of thousands of prisoners to contend with. Their supplies, which were meant to last only five days, were now partially depleted. They were to lose half their strength, and finally, to their west were still many Italian forces, and all fresh. That night of December 11th, O'Connor finally told his subordinate commanders they would be losing the 4th Indian Division. And then, without pausing, he ordered that Operation Compass would continue with the forces they still had available, the 7th Armored Division and Selby's Infantry Brigade.
Greetings, everyone from Central Virginia. So, um, sorry this one took so long to get out. I had some trouble with my microphone. Um, I couldn't figure out what was going on with it, and I was tempted to use my previous microphone, the one that cost all of $25, but I decided not to, so I, I had to record some things over and over, but I hopefully this one came out um, okay. I've got several announcements to make, so I'll just jump right into it. First of all, I'd like to thank those who uh, made donations. Um, Jennifer B. from New York, New York, Robert S. from Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and Craig N. Um, and then there's Ezekiel from Madrid, Spain. So thank you very much. I'd like to welcome aboard the new members, um, Richard P. from Australia, Madeline L. from Australia, Jim H. from Suffolk, UK, um, Penny from Bedfordshire, UK, Alan F. from Florida, U.S., Peter B. from Adelaide, South Australia, and Donna S. from London, U.K. So thank you very much. And for you members, another episode will be coming out in a few days. I've almost got it done. I just got to finish up the editing. For those of you who have written in requested information for the tour, thank you very much for that. I have sent your information on to the company. Um, if you haven't received anything yet, um, it's just because they're probably still getting the details together. But trust me, once they um, have it all together, they'll send you an email first, and then they'll give me a, a link to the website. But again... Please don't hesitate to send me an email if you're interested in going. Unfortunately, I, I can't tell you much yet because um, they're still working it all out. But as soon as I have the information, trust me, I'll get it to you. So please keep those emails coming. And just for the fun of it, I thought we'd have another newspaper replica giveaway. Um, there's nothing that you have to do as far as doing reviews or anything like that on Facebook. Um, just send me an email to the Ray at World War II Podcast dot net email address. And the two is uh, two eyes is Roman numeral. Um, just send me an uh, email and maybe put in the subject area contest, something like that. Um, this is from the Pittsburgh Sun Telegraph from uh, May 8th, 1945. At the time, it cost four cents. And it's about the um, VE Day uh, proclamation and their pledge to keep the war going against Japan. Uh, let's see here. The nation is told to stick to duty. Um, Truman had turned 61, so it was a, considered a very good birthday present for him. Some of the major players who had left the private sector to join the military were now um, giving up their commission and heading back to civilian life. So it was starting to come to an end. Uh, there's a lot of neat little statements in here. I, I think you'll like it a lot. Um, so just send me an email. I'll um, probably have the drawing a month from now just to give people time to hear this and, and enter the contest. And uh, we'll get that going, okay? So I hope you do. I think you'll really like the uh, newspaper a lot. Okay, now my last uh, announcement, and I certainly hope you're excited about this. At least I am. Um, I think I mentioned a couple times that um, – I wanted to do another podcast besides this one, and that was one of the major reasons I started the membership, thinking if I could get enough people, I could do this full time, which would give me enough time uh, to actually do both because, as you can imagine, it's a lot of research, a lot of writing, that kind of thing. But um, – I'm going to go ahead and just start my second podcast um, next month. I had originally planned on doing one on the history of the popes, um, but someone had beat me to it, Stephen Guerra. Uh, I think it's called the History of the Papacy podcast. You should check it out, and I hope he does a good job. Um, I had gathered a whole bunch of books from my brother-in-law, who's a priest, started uh, researching, and then he came out with his, so I had to ship them all back. And I'm um, so I had another podcast I wanted to do, and now there's been some buzz about somebody doing it on a certain social media. Um, so I figured I better grab it quick before someone else does because um, I really want to do it. So sometime next month, um, I'm going to have the first episode of that launched, and I don't want to give the subject away before someone um, maybe grabs it before I do. So just look around for it on iTunes, or I'll make an announcement. But it's a it's another podcast besides this one. I think you'll like it a lot. I'll try to keep it interesting. And I just want to let you know to be on the lookout for that.